Hello, and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I'm here with my co-hosts. I'm Jeff Poole. And I'm Joe Lello. And it's just us this week. You guys have told us, at least three of you, that you actually enjoy the episodes where we don't have an inter- a guest to interview, and we kind of talk amongst ourselves about what we're, what we're working on and what's working and what's not. And uh, today's topic is actually going to be kind of what does it take to break six figures a year as an author? And it's just, this has been going around. I've seen a couple comments on it this summer and uh, we grabbed some data from, this is not new stuff, but we're gonna discuss it. We've never talked about it before in this show. I've got some data from the May, 2016 author earnings report where he breaks down you know, how many people are actually doing this. And then also written word media had a survey they did earlier this summer about what makes a hundred thousand dollar author and uh some pretty interesting information and we'll add our own takes we have a couple members of the club here so hopefully we kind of know what we're talking about but you know everybody has a different path so we're not going to say like this is what you have to do Um, but before we jump into that why don't we uh, do you guys have any news that you would like to share uh, I can tell you that uh, my new fantasy series is actually going quite well. I've had a, you know, some good reviews thus far, and uh, I've had several people actually say, I can't believe you found a way to incorporate fantasy dragons and pirates all at the same time. I'm like, yeah, where there's a will, there's a way. So that's going good. I'm better than halfway through my next mystery. So keep them busy. Did you put the fantasy into Kindle Unlimited, or are you all wide with everything now? Did you actually ask me if I was going to go KU? <laughs> I was just That's curious. That's funny. <laughs> Hell no. I just okay. that. <laughs> uh, as for me, I um, my next book of Deacon story is about to go to the editor. It's all done with the beta readers, or at least the beta readers who have given any feedback. And uh, and I'm as based upon a vote from the readers, they wanted more book of Deacon following that. And uh, originally, I was going to write a big sequel to the prequel um, because that's what they voted for. But I realized that the sequel would be covering about a hundred years of story plot line. And then it would be leading into a three page, a three book series that covered about a year. So it seemed odd to do one book for a century and then a one book for three books for one year. So now I'm going to try, and this is still forming, but I'm going to try to basically do like, Chronicles. I'm going to try to do like 50,000 or so word entries in a five or eight book series and then release those in a rapid schedule once I've got a bunch of them done. And I've never, you know, we've recommended it here on the show. Lots of people have had a lot of success. I've never been any good at that. So we're going to see. My, again, my goal is around 50,000 words so I can charge around two ninety nine and do five to eight of them. Uh, what might end up happening is I realize that I can't get each story to get 50,000 and then I'll probably just make it one Titanic novel with internal episodes and try to figure out how to do that. So shooting for multiple, but I very seldom hit my target. Yeah, I I think that you would financially, it would definitely make more sense to be able to (laughs) charge for several of them, even if it was only like three or four, you know. Yeah, I mean, I could certainly try to, like, if I discover that I only have about, you know, only have about 200,000 words worth of story, if I can slide that into three books, that's three healthy books. But, um, you know, we'll see. It's going to be a long path. All right, and you, how are you doing with your pizza oven dragon novel that you did? It's your first thing in Kindle Unlimited. Uh, yeah, about, I'm anxious to hear about this one. <laughs> it, it's going about as well as you'd expect, which is to say it's not going great. I mean, the, usually it takes a while for me to have a couple of days where I have zero sales, but it didn't take me a while to get a couple of zero sales days. The read, the, the page reads are, you know, um, volatile but hitting some reasonable amounts sometimes i we're about to hit the one month mark and that's when i'm going to start doing using some of the kindle exclusive promotional stuff i mean some of like i think countdown deals you have to be in it for a month and the book has only been in it for less than a month so we're going to hit phase two of the launch cycle but as it is right now it's not burning up the charts All right. Well, sometimes you do one that's more for fun, you know, and you kind of know it's a little out there, so it's probably not going to hit all the (laughs) I saw this level of performance coming a long time, you know, from from a long way away. 
All right. Well, you did mention that it earned out, right? It's you know, yeah, you're not it in the is, hole. <laughs> it is not in the hole. It, it earned out within like the first three. Well, it earned out almost entirely within the uh, pre-order phase. So now it's more or less. Yeah, I mean. I I didn't lose money on it, but it's probably not going to have a very helpful long tail at this at this point. <laughs> All right, and um, for my news, not much has changed. You know, I'm about to put a couple more Ruby books out and wrap up the series. My pen name's doing this summer. Uh, it's done pretty well overall. The I definitely noticed the 30 day cliff. Uh, you know, this was a book that I, I was fortunate enough that Amazon's algorithms did seem to like it enough people you know, bought it, that it, it did stick for a while, even when I, I took away the advertising. And I, I feel like when you, when that happens, it's a great thing. But for most people, and not always, but for most people, you do kind of hit that point where Amazon stops promoting it. And it, it's still selling, you're still getting read through and everything. It hasn't dropped into a nothingness, but it, it did stick around 200, 250 in the whole store there for a while. So that was pretty cool. Um, but the news I thought I'd mention, aside from that, is that we're about a week out since Amazon has re uh, made it officially their Kindle Unlimited program, KENPC 3.0, which is just basically how they're calculating page reads, and then they're paying you for each page read. Uh, it, there are not very many changes that are obvious so far. I've been kind of watching the forums. There's always people out there that are, are really into testing this stuff. Uh, some people were hoping the page flip bug or feature uh, would get fixed. And some of you know already that was when people, if they read the book in page flip mode, the pages wouldn't count. And uh, some people have tested it and they saw that that is still the case. So you may want to <laughs> encourage your readers, please don't read my book in page flip or just accept that, that that's something that hopefully not a lot of people are doing right now. Uh, the, the other thing, well, they stated that now you only get credit for three up to 3,000 pages. Uh, they, that was actually a change they made quite a while ago, but I think for some reason, they put it out there like it's a new thing. So for those doing box sets, that's still a lot of pages. You know, I think most of my novels are around 400 to 600 KENPC, CP, whatever it is. Uh, and so some people have been doing the thing where with the box sets or anthologies, that kind of thing, they're getting like $10 basically for a borrow if everybody flipped through and read everything. Or as was the case, Amazon couldn't really tell if people read anything. So you'd get credit if they went to the end. And some people were, you know, wisely so putting like their star author's entry last so that everybody would want to read that particular story or that particular book. And it looks like uh, now that these things are only getting credited if people actually read them. I'm not sure how exactly they're telling, but it is, I think that's a good thing overall. You know, even though I'm in an anthology and, and our, our leader, <laughs> editor, or whatever you would call it, you know, she mentioned that our page reads were down quite a bit. And so it sounds like now you're probably only going to get credit for the stories that people actually read in an anthology. And I know I tend to only go for the ones that are by the authors I know, or just the blurb sounds like it's my kind of story. There's a lot of other things where I'll kind of start reading the first page and it's not for me and I'll flip to the next story in an anthology. So it sounds like that's what we may be seeing. And uh, for those of you that have been thinking I'm gonna to put together a multi-author box set and put it in KU and try to get the $10 per borrow because they're you know a huge number of pages, just something to consider. It may not be quite as lucrative anymore. Uh, I assume it's kind of the same with people picking up those 20 book box sets that they're going to kind of cherry pick the readers. So that is the news. Do you guys have any thoughts on the KU, KE, that thing, the changes? <laughs> None that I can vocalize. Jeff uh, yeah. remains a steadfast fan of the Kindle Unlimited. And <laughs> well, it's just Amazon exclusivity that you have a problem with, I assume, not not the subscription program yeah not the subscription program first per se it's just ye almighty amazon whom we love is uh <laughs> is i think it's got too much power at times but i'll just go no comprendo <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, it's funny because this change happened when I had about four days worth of history to look at for page reads so I have same to me I, good I hope it I hope it solved some problems 
Yeah, I've, I've got stuff in there, but because the book was selling a lot more in June and July than now, the, you know, I haven't put a new one out in the series. So the, the page read declines look pretty natural to me, what you'd expect after, you know, a month has passed and, and not as many people are reading it. So I think that those of us just putting out single novels are probably not going to be affected because we there was no reason for people ever to flip to the end of our novel and not read it unless your author notes are just amazing. But uh, so I don't think for novelists, it's going to be much of a change. And, uh, you know, I, I'm i not really with Jeff. Uh, KU has been really good to me, especially my pen name since I put it in there. I, you know, I don't care for the exclusivity, but I, right now the program is an option, you know, and you can, people are making a lot of money. So it's, it's still, I, I think it's something to consider. You just have to be flexible and kind of go with the flow, I think. And next year, if Apple takes off, maybe we'll all be talking about the things we can do to game the Apple algorithms. I don't know. Oh, go ahead and say it. The views and opinions expressed by our individual hosts don't necessarily reflect those of the other opinions. And hosts. <laughs> yes, I got to say, Jeff, please don't get us blackballed by Amazon. We would appreciate that. That's a, a lot of my income. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's jump into the main topic. And we do have a bunch of questions. I, I put this out on Twitter and several people ask questions related to the six figure thing. So I'm going to put those at the end after we kind of go over the data. So um, hopefully, and we're going to kind of try to bust a couple myths in here too. But um, all right, well, let's kind of just jump in. I'm going to read this a little bit. I'll try not to make it too dry. Uh, author earning stuff is always good. It's, it's never dry. But, uh, you know, and you guys probably remember this from the report, so I'm not going to talk about, I just have like four highlights here, you know, and if just in case you're not familiar with it, the author earnings, they, like one day a quarter, they spider all of the Amazon store and get all of the rankings for all the books, what they're selling at, and they've worked with some authors who are working with them to figure out like what sales ranking equates to how many borrows and how many sales. So it, it seems to be pretty accurate. And uh, so they were looking at in this particular quarter, how many people were making like 25,000 a year, 50,000 a year, 100,000, 250, 500, and a million is how they broke it off. And not just indie authors, this was everybody, trad published, hybrid. And so what they figured out, and uh, they did in this report have print sales factored in, audiobook sales, and ebook sales also. This is only the Amazon US store, but as they pointed out, that's a really big chunk of the market right now. Even with print books, it was like 50% of the entire market. So they figured out that 1,340 authors are earning $100,000 a year or more from Amazon sales, just amazon.com. This is not UK, Canada, Australia and stuff. Um, but half of these people are indies and Amazon imprint authors. The rest came from kind of the long, longest tenured old guard in traditional publishing. One thing they pointed out is that very few people in trad publishing were coming in in the last five, 10 years and doing these kind of numbers. It's sort of your John Grishams and your, you know, people who have been around for a while. Uh, even so, they had, let's see, fewer than 115 big five published authors and 45 small or medium published authors who debuted in the last five years are currently earning 100,000 or more. So there's those numbers. Uh, for indies, more than 425 of them are now earning at six figures. So I'll pause here to kind of get your thoughts. I mean, the, the, basically what they're saying is if you want to make money fast, indie's the way to go right now. It's not that traditional publishing could never be helpful or is not a, you know, and there are hybrid authors and they're doing both. But if you're hoping to make this soon, <laughs> go indie right now. So that report is saying in the last five years, the trad publishers, there's only like 115 of them that debuted in the last five years, but turn that around and say that the same parameters for the, uh, the 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 indie authors that's 425 more than four times almost four times right. as much there that's if i was a traditional publisher i'd be scared <laughs> with those numbers they're like why bother going for the, the the lower numbers of the royalties when you can you know go you know go indie there and get so much more in royalties but that's well crazy. it's it is worth pointing out though that there's only 1340 authors out of all the authors publishing on Amazon that are reaching this level. So you really got to be willing to do the marketing, do the publishing and publish a lot of books. So it's, it's tough, you know, and yeah. like I said, a lot of people, if they can get that trad deal and get a trilogy out there and get recognized and become an established author and then go indie, those are like the people that I think have the, 
you know, best the of hybrid both authors. worlds. Because yep. they're in the bookstores, people are finding them that way, and then they go look on Amazon, and hey, you got 20 more indie books here that are making the 70% royalty. Yeah, it's not the, it's not the same scenario that was back when we started, at least when I started in 2010. That is for certain. Right. We were very much, I think when I got started, it was just starting to be respectable to self-publish. You know, we had people like J.A. Conrath showing his numbers on his blog. That was very much what inspired me to go, oh, forget the agent hunt. I'm just going to, you know, and the, the fact that I could get a book out so quickly, I am not a patient person. So the whole two, three year thing was very unappealing. Y you not patient? Oh, I never would have guessed that. <laughs> All right. Joe, do you have any thoughts on those first couple numbers? Uh, you know, it doesn't surprise me. I wonder how much of it, like you talk about how in 2010, when most of us, start, well, when we all started, uh, it was just becoming okay. And, and you know, we didn't have the, the uh, self-hosting boom yet. I wonder how much these last five years numbers are influenced by just the fact that maybe some percentage of those people would have become successful um, traditionally published authors, but they just never even tried. Like, I wonder how much of it is a result of diverting talent away from traditional. That's, I mean, that's just a thing to speculate about because you can never really know for sure. Yeah, I think a lot of it is just too that a lot of these indie authors, and we'll talk about more in the second survey data I'm going to bring up. You know, with trad publishing, you're still, most people are kind of a one book a year thing. You, you know, I, I think I saw Kevin Hearn publish his Iron Drew books came out pretty quickly and a few other trad authors have come out quick. They, but for the most part, they're not publishing 30 novels in, in five years or, you know, and it's just much faster. As a indie author, you can like say, oh man, the uh, alien blue barbarians kidnapping earth women are totally hot right now. I'm going to write one of those and you can have it out the next month and kind of capitalize on the popularity of the trend if you enjoy writing the market stuff. And whereas with trad publishing, why even bother? Because it's going to be a two to three year kind of waiting period by the time you actually get that book out. So uh, a couple more stats, just that uh, more than 50% of all traditionally published book sales of any format in the US now happen on amazon.com. I guess I mentioned that before. And he said also 85% of all non-traditionally published book sales of any format in the US also happen on amazon.com. So no surprise, indie authors are selling a lot more on Amazon and, and trad publishing, even with all their bookstore reach out there, are still doing half their sales on Amazon. Yeah, well, why bother restricting your sales from like the, <laughs> all the countries in the world when, yes, I Amazon and I have butted heads, but I cannot, you know, scorn them and go the other way. They, they're just too big. You can't ignore them. Yeah, and it, we've certainly, I've run into people who do really well on maybe Apple, and that might be 50% of their sales, but I, so many more people I know have it where Amazon is their highest sales, and then Kindle Unlimited is their second highest, basically. It's almost like it's a whole other bookstore, you know, so, and I've certainly had a, a lot of good months where the page reads account for, and that's only, I'm not all in, you know, that I've done like one and a half series under my own name. Uh, just starting last year, and then my pen name stuff is in there. But I, and even right now, I'm taking my one series out of there. So I don't know how it would be if I was all in. I understand why authors who are all in, who are m getting hundreds of thousands of page reads a day, I, I understand why they're sticking with it. Uh, and maybe that may change down the road. You never know. But uh, uh, what's, what's encouraging, though, is we're going to jump into the next set of data. Uh, there are authors who are not all in or with KU that are making six figures too. So you do not have to try that if if it didn't work for you or you just object to it and that's perfectly fine. It's whatever you want to do, you know, whatever you want to try for your career. Some people really want to just try to maximize earnings and that's perfectly understandable. But, you know, and some people find that KU just doesn't even work that well for them depending on the genre of sci-fi and fantasy. You know, we're, we're seeing it do well in general, but um, some other, you know, I think we know somebody that does historical fiction, apparently fewer readers in some of those genres that may skew toward a different audience. And then you might not get as much of an advantage from being in KU, but enough of that. Let's jump to the written word media survey stuff. And unlike author earnings, these are all authors answered questions. So you're relying on how honest people were when they answered the questions. You know, I think with anonymous stuff, it's 
probably going to be accurate is, <laughs> I don't know, you know, there's probably less reason for people to puff themselves up or lie about it, but uh, it's not as solid of data as from the author earnings stuff. But uh, what they were kind of figuring out with their survey, which was called what makes 100,000 a year author, is what are kind of the common traits that people have. So I just kind of picked some of this stuff here. And uh, this kind of in line with the author earnings says that 88% of the 100 Kers have been writing for more than three years. So if you just started last year and you've only got two books out, you're not behind the curve. You're probably doing exactly what you should be doing. It takes time to build an audience. It takes time to get a good sized backlist out there. Do you guys have any... I got to build up the the followers there because uh, you know it's clear that you know you just can't expect to just release a book and then have it be a. I mean, yes, it happens <laughs> that you can release a book and it's an instant hit. Everybody loves it. Everybody talks about it. But logically, that doesn't happen for ninety nine point nine percent of us. Yeah, Mostly. I, I, had, I had I think three books out before I started to have any level of success, and and that also came down to figuring out the whole marketing thing, which I was really fumbling through for the first year and a half same here I, I had i had i released number three when everything took off so it yeah the first book there is like what the heck, heck am i doing this for because you know, it barely made a little blip number two was released okay seeing some interest number three okay i like being an author now <laughs> so all right and for me it took it actually took only it was my second full kind of year i was really I was full time before I was earning in full time income. I, you know, I'd kind of checked out of the day job and was really focused on this. But for me, it was 2012 was my first year when I hit this mark, and I probably had about seven or eight novels out at that point, and none of them were. You know, I was doing it was my Emperor's Edge series. I was getting towards the end of it. And it was very much a case of just kind of gradually building up. You know, I, I had figured out how to make one free, and I was. There were starting to be some places to advertise free books and various books. Uh, when I first got started, it was you could buy Goodreads ads, pay-per-click ads, which I usually struggled to even spend the $100 I, I put into the campaign. Or you could get a Kindle Nation daily ad, which apparently they're still out there, but I haven't tried them for a while. I didn't find them that effective for fantasy for me at the time. I pretty much lost money on that. But uh, at the time, Permafree was the way to get your series noticed. But I just kind of, with each new release, I got more readers and like I said, about a year and a half in, I had my first month where I hit 10,000, and that was ended up turning into a 100,000 year. And it, I feel like I was actually doing very well at the time to get that at seven or eight books. Um, I, I think, feel like most of the people now who are getting in there and making that much faster than three years are publishing a lot of books. So it's basically kind of the same. They're just, they're building up their backlist really rapidly which is absolutely fine if, you, if you're prolific and you can do that. It's sort of a shortcut and you can get a lot of momentum too from publishing quickly as we've talked before. Uh, real quick, Lindsay, uh, we have a, a viewer question from the YouTube chat, Darla Baum. She's saying, uh, random question, should free books be part of, of series to have the greatest audience pull? I pretty much already say absolutely, but let's you know, hear you say it. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, my words mean so much more. <laughs> Why should I have so many more series? Maybe <laughs> um, I, you know, I think what I would like to do now. I have a couple that I've just made permanently free, and then I have other series starters that are ninety-nine cents, and I will run sales where I'll make them free for a while. And uh, at ninety-nine cents, it's you're getting paying customers, and it seems to help a little bit with the rankings, maybe staying in a top one hundred somewhere. Uh, We've talked about before, if you are in KU, sometimes you can get away with the higher price point because so many people are borrowing the books that the price point doesn't matter. And they may even find a higher price more appealing, like they're getting a better deal for their subscription. But I, I'm a fan of a free book one, if not permanently, then cycling. And, and sometimes when you cycle off and on, that can get you noticed. There are some sites out there that kind of monitor when a book becomes free and sometimes they'll announce it. Um, do you guys, are you still, are your book ones still doing well for you? Are you having to advertise them quite a bit to keep the downloads coming in? 
I, I've noticed with, like mine. I'll, I'll, I keep fluctuating them. I think I've got two of the series of my four series right now that have the series, the freebies. But I was just thinking about that. It's like that's actually a really good idea. I think I'll, I'm going to move them all to 99 cents and then just kind of kind of rotate the the whole. You know, make one free for let's just say a month. Pull it off back to 99, and I'll move the next one over to free just to keep the because as, as I notice is, is once you know it's been if it's been free for a while and the downloads drop. Put it back to uh, what I have been doing. Put it back to a normal price. Leave it that way for like a month or two, and then drop it again. And all of a sudden, I don't know what Al or Amazon likes about that, but all of a sudden, it just explodes with the numbers, and it just starts downloading in, and the sales start coming back in there. And it's just what I've noticed there. So, but I, I like the idea of just you know, keeping it, you know, not necessarily free, but down at ninety nine cents because most people are like, yeah, if, if you don't, I mean, if it's, if, you, if it sucks, it's only ninety nine cents, no big deal. But and then it's still a, a paying book there. This for me, uh, all of my series starters are free still, and for a long time, uh, that was the only thing I needed to keep my income pretty high. In the past year, or t past two years probably, that's not been the case. For a while, I would make about five times as many free downloads as sales, and uh, now it's about equal free downloads to sales, which I suppose means one-fifth the number of those are becoming sales later on. So it's going to be a downward trend unless I keep boosting them. But I also find that free promotions, number one, are cheaper. And number two, tend to have a much more, I mean, like the spike you get on free downloads on a promotion is much bigger of a spike than the spike in sales you make off of a non-free promotion. So uh, I feel like I'm, I'm going to keep my free series starters free. But if I was to do another lengthy series, I might try doing a 99 cent, at least to start off and then make it free later on. Right. And BookBub in particular is something like 270 for a free fantasy or sci-fi novel, as opposed to like 600 for a 99 cent one. And you're absolutely right. You know, I did Star Nomad with them last year and got like 40,000 downloads. And, uh, you know, you're going to have probably less buy through on the free downloads than on uh, something they actually bought, you know, because people will buy something for free and just be like, eh, whatever, I'll give it a try. That's not my usual genre, but <laughs> it's, it's free. Um, but with a 99 cent one, you tend, you can make your money back on the sales of that book, right? You might get, even though it's 600 some dollars, you might sell 2000 or 3000 copies of it at 99 cents. So there's that, but you're getting less people into the series. Yeah. Potentially, you know, if you're, it depends on how good your book one is, if people want to <laughs> go on and read them. There's also the very mysterious thing that I've noticed with book bubs sometimes with a free promotion in that I get about 200 sales. Uh, well, 200 is probably a high estimate, but I have gotten about 200 sales of books two and three of a series that the free one is, is being promoted. So there is some percentage of book bub readers who, when they see a free book one, will buy the whole series immediately. Like, I'll, I'll get a weird cross-series bump on a free promotion. It's very strange. On the, on the first day. Like, I would expect it in a few days, but at least... Hey, no arguments there, right? Yeah, I'm not going <laughs> to complain. It just strikes me as interesting that, that some percentage of people will buy the whole series based on the fact the first one was in BookBub. I, I have a, a viewer question from uh, YouTube. David Heyman is asking... If the chance comes up, I have a, he says, I have a whole and edited trilogy ready to go for 2018, but I can't decide if I should release them all at once or at intervals. I would probably plan to do it maybe four weeks apart. Give it a try. That way you have a little more time on the hot new releases list, potentially, if you can make it up there. Um, but if book one is selling like hotcakes, you know, <laughs> and you have the other two ready, there's nothing wrong with putting them out there. It's just kind of, if you want to stagger things a little bit so that you don't have as long of a gap before, if there's, if you said it was a trilogy, so it's probably, there won't be a book four, but, you know, if you put all these books out and then it's a year before you publish anything else, people may forget about you, but, you know, I might be tempted if I had a trilogy just to throw it all out there at once or within maybe two weeks, because I, I've certainly seen some people do it and, you get more people buying book two and three if they're ready immediately after they read book one. You'll definitely get people will forget about it or they'll check back later maybe. <laughs> you know, I think I saw a stat somewhere it takes like four books before a reader actually remembers you and your series and <laughs> enough to like think, oh, maybe I should see if they have a new book out or, you know, maybe I want to sign up for their mailing list. Um, that's just my thoughts on that if you guys want to chime in. Uh, same thoughts here. 
I, I was I, I've because I've released two books before. One, you know, the closest I've ever released two books is one one month apart. That's when I did the only cliffhanger I ever did, and the void getting crucified. I made sure I was ready with the next one, and to me that seemed to work really well. I got a lot of sales both on what that one came out and number four is ready to pick right up where I left off. So thankfully the reviews weren't too harsh. Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, waiting a little bit. Um, simultaneous release. I would. You know, this is just me projecting, but I would be concerned. People would be like, "Well, why weren't these just one book then? You know, like, how come it's three books at the same time instead of one book?" So I would definitely want to separate. Plus, again, I feel like there is more to be gained from having momentum for longer than for having a gigantic initial spike. I will add that my series that have done best and stuck best and made me the most money was last summer when I did my Fallen Empire series. I had book one and two out in the same week. Book three followed only four weeks later. Book four came right after that, and it was an awesome summer. So uh, I cannot say anything wrong about that method or <laughs> say don't do it. Strike while the iron's hot. If you've got, you know, if you got a series, three of them, and release them one right after the other, like a month or so apart, man, you're gonna, you know, keep the readers enthralled, ready to go, and you can just put a little thing at the end of the book. Yep, number two is ready to go. Here's the link. And yeah, number three is ready to go. Conclusion. Here's the link. And you better believe that if you if they've, if you've got them snagged in for the number two book, you better believe that'll follow through for number three. All right, let me get back to the survey here. Another data point was that none of their survey responders making 100,000 were trad published. And it, it just may be a little bit, it's the indie authors who are going to their site. These are, I think, what are these? These are bargain booksy and free booksy, I think. I hope <laughs> I got that right. So we're the ones that can change our prices and run sales. Trad pub, they have to wait for their publisher to run a deal. But it, it does kind of suggest that the same author earnings type of thing that it's just going to take a lot longer to get things rolling with trad publishing. Um, they did have some hybrid authors that answered who either got a contract due to their indie success or decided to make the started out trad and then decided they wanted to do some indie stuff and make the higher royalties. So, you know, like we talked about before, if you have that option, it's something you may want to consider. Um, I personally wouldn't do it for small press. I would, if I was going to sign with anybody, it would have to be big five. I'd want the bookstore thing, you know, kind of whatever they're going to put behind it to really get the books out there. I, I feel like with small presses, it may, you know, it's fine for some people that don't want to do anything themselves, but they don't seem to have, most of them don't seem to have more reach than indie authors they are kind of doing the same things for marketing as we are. So you may not necessarily, you know, if they're just, especially if they're just doing ebook only, which some of them do to save money and a print on demand, you know, it just seems to be kind of on par with indie publishing, except you're making less less money because they're taking a cut. All right, uh, as we said, you don't have to be exclusive with Amazon. There was a mix of people that were uh, responding that were staying wide. And I think you're gonna find that probably more so with the authors that have been doing this longer. Like we all had fan bases on Barnes and Noble and Apple and Kobo before Amazon's exclusivity, KDP Select became a thing. So it's it's a little harder to make that decision than if you're just starting new and saying, let me try this. Um, uh, go ahead. Uh, real, real quick, were there any numbers too for that when it says that you don't have to be exclusive with Amazon, there was a mix. Do we know like for instance, let's just say you know, 50% of them were exclusive, 50% weren't, or did we have any numbers there? I didn't grab them. I will definitely put a link to both the survey and the author earnings report in the show notes so that if people want to go look in, there's a lot more information on, on both of these. You could spend an hour, especially the author earnings, <laughs> reading through everything. So um, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure. I didn't see that at a glance, but it could be in there. Um, they talked a little bit about how much people were spending to be the hundred in the hundred K club, <laughs> uh, you know. And it was actually surprising. And I think this was the most controversial thing on this survey was that a lot of authors were not paying very much for their editing. I, I pay my editor about it ends up being about a thousand dollars for a hundred thousand words. And that was at the really high end of what people were paying. So I don't know. I, I guess my thought is if you're making good money, pay your people well so that they can make a living and they want to continue working with you. But, you know, and it didn't specify in this survey, whether these were romance people or sci-fi people, or, uh, they might be writing really shorter novels. So that's something, but nobody was spending a fortune on editing. So, you know, I, and I've said this before, I don't think 
you're gonna you're gonna have a harder time making this profitable if you're paying for developmental editing as well as copy editing so i would cultivate some beta readers and use those people to kind of get the structural stuff right and make sure your story is keeping people engaged you really kind of need to be at the level in writing where you can pretty much get the plot stuff right without a lot of help um, and if you're not you and some people will do it for like their first book they'll hire someone to kind of learn the ropes uh, you know, I did the online writing workshop for a few years before I did this, and that was kind of how I learned the ropes. But um, it's it's tough if you're going to drop 5,000 for editing. That's It's just a really big pit to dig yourself out of, especially as a new author. Do you guys have one chime in on editing expenses? Uh, I was just going to say, yeah, it's, editing, I've, when, I, when I very first started out, I found, you know, someone that, you know, a really, really good copy, copyright ed editor there, and she did, I think, the first couple of books for, like, must have been like two, three hundred bucks, and all of a sudden she got popular, <laughs> and the the price of that sucker just skyrocketed. It was like, okay, well, now either you can keep paying the price there, but then you start wondering, okay, because myself, when I first released my first couple of books, you know, I, I wasn't, uh, I was, I was still, you know, I was doing this as just like a little side thing, sort of thing, because I, I enjoyed writing there and didn't really have a huge budget for covers, and because because the budget I did have, I was going towards covers because you want to make sure you can get as nice covers as possible. Editors, I mean, obviously you wanted to have you know good as much as you can actually afford, but man, there was people out there that charged an arm and a leg and I clearly they must be making money doing this or else they didn't want to do it so therefore they give them such a high price that they leave them alone I don't know but but yeah I mean I'd, I'd say on average for a book you're looking at probably at least for me you know six seven hundred bucks minimum yeah I have had three editors and two of them basically around that I mean again I write longer books so sometimes I get up to fifteen hundred dollars for the edit but again it's about basically a thousand dollars for a hundred thousand words and uh, I had the other editor worked for free but she uh, was a fan who just basically read uh, gave me a titanic number of corrections and then she kept on doing that and uh, eventually I sort of talked her into taking money which is an unusual way to do business but uh, <laughs> So Please, here's money. Th Take it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think the first time I traded a license for Word, she was not even she didn't have a uh, you know Microsoft Word yet, and I was like, well, I'll I'll, I'll buy Word for you at the very least. <laughs> but since then, I believe she's gone full time. I haven't used her in a few years. And we should point out that we're all, I think we're all talking about just copy editing. Basically, they're going through looking for missing words, a weird sounding sentence. I will occasionally my editor will like if a fight scene or something doesn't seem logical, she'll kind of point out like, OK, I, I think you started that with four bad guys and then there were six and they didn't all get accounted for. So. My, my favorite one I yeah my favorite one I always hear is like okay you're, you're doing like a fight scene with these people over here but then this person disappears and never talk about it for the rest of the book I'm like oh, damn I did do that didn't I all right all right I can fix it I've been all lucky I've been lucky enough that the two editors that I still work with seem to enjoy my writing and tend to have an opinion so whereas they're certainly not doing a full developmental edit very frequently i'll get character commentary and stuff like that just because they're familiar with my other books and we're like you know what i think this is more something that that person would say like i think you're correct <laughs> yeah my editor knows me by now she doesn't really get my humor <laughs> but she kind of knows she's like i think this is something that one of your characters would have said or this sounded a little stilted i'm like you're right let's put a joke there <laughs> Um, as far as covers go, too, it sounded like uh, none of the 100K people were paying more than $1,000 a cover. So, uh, you know, in sci-fi fantasy, sometimes we will get up there because we'll do custom illustrations, but it's probably not necessary. There are some people doing amazing work out there with kind of a combination of Photoshop manipulation and, you know, using maybe an illustrative background, which is probably not as expensive and time consuming for them to do as a full on character illustration or dragons. Um, I've had a couple of covers where I spent more than that, but I've also had a lot where I spent like 150, 200. My, my whole Dragon Blood series, which is uh, one of my best selling series is bought a house kind of thing. Uh, those were all like $150 Photoshop covers. So even in sci-fi and fantasy, don't feel you have to do a custom illustration if you're doing your first books and you, you want to save money. That stuff also takes time. So, you know, usually the Photoshop stuff's a lot quicker, but um, 
you can always do custom stuff later. You can always replace the covers. I'm doing that now with uh, some of my older stuff from 2011, 2012. I've kind of been gradually replacing covers that maybe weren't as good or weren't as good of a fit with, with illustrated ones. Are, is, are you guys kind of in that ballpark too for covers le less than that? Pretty much, yeah. My, 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 see, my very first cover, <laughs> I made the mistake of trying myself, so we know not to do that again. Uh, and then uh, for the second one my, of my Bakken Chronicles, I said, oh, you know what, let's do this professionally. I found an artist. She did a fantastic job and between that and typography. It was about, I don't know, it was about 400 bucks, I'd say. But man alive, you know, people responded, oh, some cover, is that a scene from the book? And then sales took off. So, and then from there, she kept charging more every single year, every single book I actually released with her because she was getting more popular as well. But I think the most I've spent thus far is about 700, I think it was there. And I'm okay paying for it as long as, you know, the work matches what I want it there. But, but uh, so far with my fantasy, those are the ones that are the most expensive. And I like specifying, okay. I know, I know. There's a lot of people that say you don't necessarily need to have a scene from the book as the cover, but that's always been my thing. I like having something where you look at that's going, "Yep, that actually happened right in the book, page, you know, whatever it happens to be there." So that that's just me personally. I don't bear in mind on my covers. I don't do the whole customized front and back, just the front. I, I take care of the spine and the back cover myself. Um, I have worked with three different cover artists, although almost all of my like for sale books are by the same guy, Nick Delagaris. And the cost has been about 700 to, sorry, about 500 to 900, which, but like the very strong average is 750. Almost all of my covers end up being about 750. The most I've ever paid for a cover is a book that was never published. It was a collaborated book in which I paid half of $5,000 for a cover. The book never came out and I ended up selling the cover back to someone else who I think is going to be finishing that book. So technically that cost me nothing. All right. I will say, too, that my Fallen Empire books, which I talked about doing really well last year, those were kind of in the same ballpark as Joe's. He's in the UK, so I'm never sure exactly how much I'm paying until I get the, you know, the PayPal bill is like 778.23 cents for this cover. So for the custom illustrations, that's about where I've been, too. But like I said, I, I don't think you need that necessarily as a, as a new author. If you're coming in from a lucrative, you know, some people have a day job that's whatever, they, it pays well, you know, you're a computer programmer or something, so you can afford it. But uh, I don't, I think it's not a bad idea to kind of have that shoestring startup mentality though. Cause I've, I've seen people come in and like, yeah, I got a developmental editor, I paid 5,000 for that and copy editing, I'm paying 2,000 for three covers and I'm gonna drop 5,000 right away on marketing. And you look and there's their book with a 500,000 sales ranking on Amazon. So, you know, that, you know, you don't wanna say they just threw away the money, but I think if you can learn how to do it on a budget, it's probably not a bad idea to have that mentality going forward. Less stress overall that <laughs> you're like, this is the one that has to, to be a hit. Um, okay, next data point was that it was interesting that all of the 100Kers said they did paid marketing. And it, it sounds like just about everybody said they handled it themselves. Like nobody's hiring a PR person and nobody's handing off their Facebook ads to some guru. guru. There's a four letter word I can't say. Uh, so in case you're wondering like, oh, should I have a VA or somebody handling my Facebook ads? You know, probably nobody's going to care about your money and whether or not things are profitable as much as you're going to care. So it's probably worth learning just enough on what, you know, and maybe you never get into Facebook ads. Maybe you try Amazon ads or maybe you just stick to, you know, uh, outside of new releases for me, the majority of the time I stick to trying to get the book bub. And if I can't get that, you know, maybe free booksy or bargain booksy, I'll kind of stack some of the smaller sites for like a launch promo or after the series is all out and I want to run a sale of make book one free. Some of those, it's hard to break even, but when you get to the point where you maybe have six or eight books, which is, uh, this wasn't in any of the surveys, but I feel like for me, that's been really integral. Is that the word I want? <laughs> Probably not important. Because every time you advertise book one, you have the potential that gets seven more full price sales and maybe more, you know, like Joe's got his expanding book of Deacon world here, you know, and I've kind of done that with my Ember's Edge and I may do another series in my Dragon Blood world. So then you may end up with a reader who buys 20 or 30 of your books after you spent a couple hundred dollars on that ad to get some people. So uh, that I think, even though it's not in the surveys, that's probably really important. And in sci-fi and fantasy, it's pretty typical. It's going to be tough to do it with single 
standalone books. But um, what do you guys think? You know, and I didn't see any data on how much people are spending on marketing. I've heard uh, you know some romance people that spend like ten, fifteen thousand a month on Facebook ads, and obviously they're probably making forty, fifty. But you know, I, I think it's and it's okay, I guess, <laughs> at that level. But I don't do it. I you know I might do like. 500 usually might be a, a launch of a new book in a series. I threw some with the Ruby series at the BookBub pay-per-click ads just because the book was doing well anyway and I kind of wanted to see how it would do. So I spent more on that one than usual but only after I already saw that it was working. Uh, you know maybe commit to spending $200 on a launch and try to stack some ads but you know and then see how the series is doing. Get a feel for how many people read book one and then also go and buy two, three, four. And if people are falling off and not doing it, maybe it's time to try a new series. But um, yeah, what are you guys doing when it comes to paid ads? And are you doing Facebook ads? Have you ever thought of hiring someone to help with that stuff? I've always tossed around the idea that it would be nice to be making you know, so much that I could theoretically just you know, delegate out these some of these tasks that I don't like doing. But then it comes to surrendering control over a lot of your stuff. And I was like, yeah, I'm more of a control freak than that. I don't think I'd be comfortable, even if it's someone I knew, a friend or a family member. You're still placing all your security in someone else's hands. So I'd have to say probably not. Now, I've used, you know, I've used the Facebook ads. I've, I've tried you know, a, a couple different variations. And I'm, I don't necessarily – Maybe I haven't found the right, I don't know, recipe yet to try and, and get the Facebook ad right. I break even every single time, but it's not, I don't see like these huge sales surges or anything. So and I've yet to try an Amazon ad. I, I'm thinking about it. I just, I don't know enough about it yet. I need to do some more research for, first. But but yeah, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've been trying to get a BookBub ad as well. Those little guys are picky <laughs> about what they take. But uh, thus far, it's for me, it's been predominantly Facebook ads. And I, every once in a while, I'll try another variation to see how well it works there. And thus far, I seem to just be breaking even with it. So I haven't hit this magic combination yet. I don't do a tremendous amount of paid advertising. I'm lucky enough, I get about two or three book bubs a year, uh, which is very nice. Um, and when I do a launch, I will usually boost a, a post and maybe do a uh, an Amazon ad. But I don't think I've ever really had an Amazon ad pay, you know, like be worthwhile, so to speak. They actually give you the whatever the return on investment or whatever in the calculation. I've never had that be a you know uh, a good number. So I probably end up if you were to average it out, spending three or four hundred dollars per launch on advertising, but about 300 of those dollars are actually a book bub that comes out six months after the book did to sort of maintain the sales as opposed to get the sales in the first place. All right. And I should say, if I found something that really worked, I'd be happy to spend $10,000 a month to make an extra $20,000 a month. It's just, it's tough and you need to be careful. I mean, you need to be less careful if you're making a ton of money, I guess, but it's just I still think it's a good idea to make sure your numbers are adding up and it's actually profitable there's it just gets more complicated there's more bookkeeping if you you know you have to figure it all out and it, you know uh maybe we'll have a guest on someday that's just killing it with Facebook ads I've I feel like it's really competitive now out there and you're really having to bid a lot to get clicks and it's hard to make a lot when your book's only three bucks and you're paying 50 cents for a click and you're only going to get two dollars on the royalty and not everybody that clicks is going to buy but e e when you do have a longer series it's like uh i'm with joe on the amazon ads i i leave them running but i i lose money on paper because it's a, a 99 cent book one but it happens to be in KU. So it's going to get some page reads in addition to the sales. And presumably some of those particular people, you know, it's hard to say, you don't know, like when it's sell through, say you get a 50% sell through from book one to two, you don't know if those were the people that came from Amazon ads or they came from Facebook or they just were surfing the list and found you. But uh, the longer series you have, if you're, and if you see the sell through is good, then it can make sense to spend more on selling book one. But I, I thought it was interesting that nobody was having anybody handle their PR. Well, we don't, I've never met any author, India or otherwise, that thought paying thousands of dollars for a PR person was a, ended up being a good investment. Those people are probably not any more savvy with on, online marketing than you are. And when you're selling ebooks, online is the place to sell ebooks. And I'm not saying don't ever buy a, don't ever hire a VA. It's just that you probably don't want somebody else handling like your Facebook ads and 
that's probably something you should do yourself. The, the money stuff, you know, have them answer their email or, you know, put together the Facebook networking things with other authors. There's no reason why you can't do that kind of marketing, hand it off to someone else, especially if they're in the biz and they're experienced and, and you're seeing more people now that are kind of hanging out their shingle as author assistants. But um, I, I thought it was kind of cool actually that most of these people were just doing it themselves still. Uh, a couple more points here. It said that 20% of the 100 Kers still had day jobs, but that they averaged 30 hours a week of writing overall as a group. So nobody's lucking into this. These people are working their butts off. You know, uh, a lot of people probably keep their day job for security. They're trying to pay off a mortgage or something before they quit, or maybe they just love their day job. So uh, you don't have to quit when you get to 100,000. <laughs> I'd be interested in knowing of that 20%, how many are married, how many have kids, <laughs> how many have like, these typical familial distractions that a lot of people have there. Because you know, how many guests have we actually listened to that said they can only write when they can actually bust out the time for it, whether on a bus ride to work or four in the morning or, or whatnot. So I'd be interested to know, you know if you're obviously, if you're working 30 hours a week and you're still writing and you're making that much writing, clearly you've got to carve out a nice little uh, chunk of time for yourself. So I'm just, just wondering if they had kids demanding their attention or an understanding spouse or something like that. Dogs. Dogs. No, um, I, I read it poorly, actually. Let me say it. It's 20% of the 100Kers still had day jobs, period. And overall, the 100K group 100% of them were working 30 hours a week. So it may be the people who still had day jobs were pulling the average down. They're only working 10 hours a week. And then you had other people like me who are obsessed and always <laughs> have a date with the editor who are like doing 10 hours a day and don't take days off unless it's between projects. So that was just the average of the group as a whole. We're doing 30 wow. hours a week. And uh, this data, I kind of hinted at this before, this is the last point here. The 100 Kers had an average of 30.3 books in their backlist. The most an author had on the survey was 63, the minimum was seven. So I know we have a lot of folks out there that you're putting your first book out now or you have a couple out. So if you're not there yet, <laughs> realize that most of these people, not only are they you know, doing it for five years or more, but uh, if, if they're newer, they probably have still put, managed to put out 20, 30, 40 books. And it's, it's something that just, for most of us, it's going to come with time. I've told it before when I got started in Christmas 2010, I was so bummed because I only had two novels and they weren't in the same series. They weren't related. And I put them out there at $2.99 with the cheap covers that I, I got from a guy in like India, did a painting for me. And he did the text all wonky. It looked more like a comic book because he didn't, you know, I didn't know about fonts and neither did he so but it over time it adds up you know now i'm sure i have at least 50 out uh i haven't counted in a while but that's novels not like short stories and stuff um we're, wait, wait your first two books had were two separate series right off the bat so you're already yes. creating separate series so what you get to throw with the first one like yeah let's try something new and go for something else I wrote the first one and I then I was kind of looking at agents and what they wanted and nobody wanted high fantasy basically was what it was kind of steam age it really did, nobody wanted it so I was like well let me write something else and then the second book was kind of a high fantasy <laughs> so it wasn't any better it was like science fantasy which is probably even harder sell than just the traditional swords and sorcery kind of thing so basically I had two books that because I didn't want to write book two in the Emperor's Edge series until I had an agent for book one uh, and then but while I was finishing up the second book encrypted was the book and there was a standalone that's when I found Conrad's blog and that same fall I got a Kindle of my own I was like wait a minute these there are books that are not traditionally published in the Amazon store when did this start happening I I'm not quite sure how I was not an early adopter with that I I should have been like Kindle day one, but I, I you know, I was kind of actually anti ebook in the beginning. I was like, oh, print's way better than ebooks. Was, uh, yeah, see, I, I was yeah. the opposite. I, I knew when I first started, I'd be selling way more ebooks than print copies. I just did a print copy just because I like holding an actual physical copy of my book in my hand, but crazy. All right. Well, I was going to kind of bust some myths. I'll just do this really quickly. One of the myths is that you have to network a lot or get a lucky break. And I, using myself as an example, I very much did not. I started a blog and kind of wrote about my journey early on. And that gave me something to tweet about. And maybe I don't, I didn't get on Facebook right away. 
So I was never a networker. I'm an introvert. I don't like doing this stuff even online. I've grudgingly come out of my shell a little bit the last couple of years, but I'm still very, yeah, I don't want to owe anybody a favor. So I, I don't like, and I don't like alienating my list maybe by publishing or publicizing something I'm not in love with. So I personally, you know, I've certainly had some things that were a little lucky along the way, but nothing that made it, you know, I didn't have anything stick for a year in the top 100 and make me a household name. I'm obviously still nobody's heard of me <laughs> outside of like the very indie sci-fi reading community. So if, do you guys are you kind of the same way? You've just sort of, I don't think you guys have had any, I haven't seen you on Oprah, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm, I classify myself an introvert, but you know, the other job I, I've done, you know, from time to time, in addition to the author side, is I'm also a computer tech, at which has forced me to get out of my little quiet shell and actually have to talk to people there, which is still not my preference. But you know, I can usually judge. I'm getting pretty good at judging a, a person when I walk in the door whether this is going to be a pleasant tech call or this is going to be a, 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 a grumpy one there because they, whether they have a sense of humor or whatnot. But, uh, but no, I, I'm, I, I'm getting significantly better. It's just, I, I don't like speaking in front of big crowds. I have yet to hold a book signing, even though I've had numerous people offer to host one for me. I'm like, I just don't want to be that dodgy person sitting behind a desk and just waiting for people to come up to me. So it, not my thing. Uh, yeah, I have not done a tremendous amount of networking until fairly recently and even even recently not a huge amount uh, lucky break I had a lucky break in that my perma free was picked up by a, a website called pixel of ink but that was only for about like basically I made about three thousand dollars off of that bump and the subsequent success came from how I invested that three thousand dollars into the books again so uh, I got some luck early on but it was not responsible for the hundred K all right. Yeah. If you get enough books out there, though, and you're in it long enough, a few good things are bound to happen to you. You know, I was one of the early BookBub people found Emperor's Edge and promoted it for free. They didn't have as big of a list yet, but they they had they came came out of nowhere and they picked a few indies that maybe had blogs or something. And but it, it was just you know you get a, get a bump for a while and then things settle back down. Um, Another myth is that you have to write romance or erotica or, you know, I'm being some real hot popular genre and I am not. <laughs> not only am I not, but most of my stuff doesn't really fit that squarely into epic fantasy or, or swords and sorcery. Thank you, noisy dogs. <laughs> they always know when it's been an hour. Uh, you know, I assume you guys are the same way. You're not secretly writing erotica and romance on the side. Nope. Fan, epic fantasy and like I said, just as last year, it started up mystery. That's pretty much the only two I write in thus far. Epic fantasy, sci-fi, and steampunk are my earners. All right, we all know steampunk kills it, <laughs> or that yeah, you can get in the top hundred thousand or the top <laughs> hundred on the, in the category with a hundred thousand overall. But um, another myth we talked about this: you don't have to be exclusive with KU or Amazon. Um, you also don't have to do any, everything right from day one. I, I know we've all kind of shared our stories on here before. I don't think any of us figured it out and we're killing it right out of the gate. It wasn't, I think I had three books out of my first series and figured out how to make a book one free on Amazon was what really started getting the ball rolling for me, but I did not kill it out of the gate. <laughs> All right. Last uh, myth is that you kind of have to, you can't do this doing fiction. You have to sell some nonfiction on the side and, and maybe a course for authors. And while I know many fiction authors who do that because they enjoy it and for them, it can be a big source of income. I, there are many, many authors, not just in romance, you know, fantasy, sci-fi too, that are doing great by just selling fiction. All right. You guys have any thoughts on that? I'm going to jump into a few questions that we had before we finish up nonfiction. Non yeah, I don't think I realize you're never supposed to say never, but I am pretty certain you are never going to see me writing a nonfiction book. Ever. Yeah, I'm all fiction too. However, I do have a series. I'm basically documenting one of my books being written from beginning to end on my website, and if it ends up being around fifty thousand words, I might wrap that up and make it available. But I'm not gonna. I have not had to rely upon any uh, uh, nonfiction, and really never had any plan to do so. All right, cool. Well, let's jump into our first question. It's from Ashley. I'd like to know the general time split, for example, 40 to 60% for marketing versus creating time. 
I find myself liking marketing but not making much time for it. Do you guys want to go first? Marketing, creating time to market. Uh, well, how much, much time are you spending writing versus how much time you spend marketing? Oh, I would say that's for me, it's like 95, five, 95 writing, five marketing. I only worry about marketing when I've got a series to sell essentially. Yeah, my, uh, I don't really slight, like my time management is not uh, as precise as it should be, which is probably why I, uh, I should improve that. But as it stands right now, I don't really spend a lot of time on schedule doing marketing. I, With the exception, I suppose, some would say staying active on like social media is a form of marketing, but I'm not even do using it for that. It's, it's So less than 10% certainly for marketing and 90% uh, of, of my time that is work is writing. And I'm okay. definitely the same way. <laughs> Um, that's how you end up with 50 novels after uh, five years or, or whatever that's been. And uh, marketing can be more worthwhile after you have the eight novels in a series, you know, a little more. When you just have one book out, especially, I would not spend very much on it uh, unless you were that person that was doing a trilogy and launching everything at once. Then, you know, buy some ads and maybe try to network a little bit and get in one of those multi author box sets. Uh, maybe write a short story in an anthology with other authors that leads into your trilogy. That's something I did a bunch of that kind of stuff with my last couple of series. Um, so yeah, I focus on writing for sure and, and just getting books out that people love. Uh, Ashley also asked how much, also how much of income comes from paid ads versus organic slash networking? So I got to ask what is meant by organic slash networking? I would probably doing like Facebook events with other authors or maybe like joining in box sets, that kind of thing. Uh, social networking sort of thing. I would definitely say the vast majority of mine comes from the paid ads versus the little, you know, I mean, I've done some of the notion social networking where yes, it's great. You want know, to meet other authors and whatnot. And you know, you like their page, they like your page, you sign up for their news. But uh, predominantly though, I'm, I'm looking for the readers of the fans. I, I'm, I'm actually looking for people that are interested in buying the rest of the books. So I, I'd have to go with more for the paid ads. Yeah, I uh, I mean, I have a little bit of a hard time tracking exactly where my advertising, like income earned from ad advertising comes from. Uh, I would say that uh, the vast majority of my trackable income, like that comes from advertising is from paid advertising. I think that when it comes to collaborating with other authors or, or being part of a box set, generally speaking, that's sort of phantom in the background, like giving you a, a five, 10 percent boost that you can't really codify and with it gets lost in the noise of your other sales so it's hard to tell but i would say the the majority of my income from advertising is from paid advertising i am too and just because i do more of it uh you know kind of in the beginning usually it's like you have more time than you have money and as you get some success and get more obligations and stuff down the road it tends to switch and become you have more money than you have time so Booking an ad on FreeBooksy, you know, takes like three minutes. So I'm much more likely to do those kind of things than get involved where I have to sit at the computer for a Facebook event or, uh, you know, and a lot of the, the box sets and things like that, I've, I've definitely found those useful. But it's, again, I'm not putting much of my time in it. I very specifically will find somebody to organize it. <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn, for the ones you've done. Or I just wait to be approached about being in one which is, you know, and, but that kind of comes with having a podcast or a blog or something. So people actually know you exist and, and that can be, take a little time. So I guess if we called our podcast networking, that that's taking time, but I, I know none of us <laughs> sell many books directly as a result of this podcast, but uh, it is, it's kind of hard to track. It's the kind of thing where maybe because somebody knows you, they'd invite you to a box set, whereas they wouldn't have known about you otherwise. All right, Jesse asks, when should we spend money on advertising? After one book or after a full series? I would, I would say at least two, if not three books out. That way, I mean, if, if necessary, if your books just aren't selling that well, you can do the whole you know, reduction in book one, get some ads for that, or make it perma-free for a little while. And, but definitely at least you know, two books, I would say probably comfortably three. Yeah, I agree. I feel like three for me was the magic number. Uh, it, with any of my series, I didn't really find that I had a tremendous amount of value through sell-through until I had three of them. So 
you know, you can certainly a advertise at any time. I said, you can certainly advertise at any time that you have a product. But I have found that once you, like, it doesn't even really feel like a series until there's a third one. So I feel like that's when it's really most useful to start. Uh, I would say the same thing, although I fully admit that I tried to sell my first book. I, like I said, I did the good get Goodreads ads. I got that Kindle Nation daily deal. It's hard not to, it's hard not to just want to throw everything you all your effort you can at it to try to make it do well uh probably just wait though to spend a lot of money uh, there's a lot of things you know i i did with my ruby series this summer a couple people approached and said hey do you want to do a newsletter swap and and usually i don't do those kind of things because i don't want to promote other people's books that i haven't read but ruby's a little newer needed a little help and i was like well and that particular the sci-fi romance genre i feel like the readers this is a horrible thing to say but i feel like the readers are not very picky so and I made it clear it wasn't a recommendation because I hadn't read the book, but it seemed like it seems like there's so many books in there that have a really good rating for I would not even read them. Uh, I'm, I'm a little pickier. Um, so I, I didn't think the readers would mind, but that is the kind of thing you can do that costs you nothing. You if you can, uh, you do kind of have to have a list. And we've talked about that in the last show we did together, building a list. But, uh, I, you know, wait until you start spending thousands of dollars on a book release. As we already talked about, none of us spend that much on a launch anyway. Um, the only time I have, like I said, is when a book was already doing well. And I thought, well, let me goose things a little bit and see if I can keep it rolling. But after the book had already well more than paid for what I was going to spend. All right. Christy asks, do you need to have audio and foreign translations to hit six figures? I've never, I don't have any audiobooks yet, even though I'm still trying. Uh, I haven't worried about foreign rights or anything. So, Joe, I know you've got stuff, you know, info about your German side of things. So, let's hear your take. Um, I definitely didn't need uh, audio or translations to hit six figures. I didn't get either of them until I had already hit six figures once. But uh, you, you can definitely help. I know a lot of other people have had a lot more success with their audiobooks than I have, but I have made, you know, my. German translation has been well worth my time. So uh, certainly worth pursuing. I wouldn't say necessarily worth financing on your own, but don't necessarily turn your nose up at if somebody comes asking, as long as they're reputable. Uh, I also was, I think, there before I was making any money from audiobooks. Uh, foreign translations can be, if you're trad published, sometimes that can be a really nice chunk of change. They can get like forty, fifty thousand dollars. I've heard on um, from selling all over the world the rights. So, but I don't know how much that comes in in that first year and when they get it and and that kind of thing. But uh, certainly for indie authors, no, I, I doubt many of these people are. You know, some of us are just now starting to make some money in audiobooks. Mine is not insignificant, but it's certainly not necessary to to make the six figures. Foreign translations, I have one, and uh, I don't think I've made any money from it. Which language? German. Uh, German My publisher too. didn't do KU like Joe's did. <laughs> Yeah, right. KU really, really, especially in the first month of the first book, KU was a spectacular help. So, like, good, good for them making that decision. All right, Madeline asks, "What was the tipping point for number of books? And also, what advice isn't relevant anymore? Like, has the landscape changed for newer authors?" Uh, my tipping point was once I hit book number three and I made book number one perma-free, two and three just blew the hell up. It was just so very nice. And advice for anything that isn't relevant anymore. Um, well, see, the perma-free isn't quite as effective as it used to be, but it is still a very viable technique for getting your book out there. So not too terribly much in my mind's eye. Uh, for me, I mean, if we're talking about um... Uh, 100k. The well, tipping point for me in terms of consistent uh, uh, earnings was, I think, eight books. But really, realistically, it was I had three books in the same series and two books in another series. So I guess the second series was the tipping point for me. But most of the earnings was the first one. So three books in a series plus some others is my tipping point. And as for a change, I have to agree. F uh, free used to be set it and forget it, and you just make money. And now free is just uh, one of the weapons in your holster. 
All right, and I already told my story earlier. I think I was maybe around six or seven into my Emperor's Edge series, and I had one or two of the standalones out when I kind of hit that first month that was over 10K, and then that led into that year being over 100K. And I, I will point out, those books do not sell that much now. Those books are not earning me 100K. Well, I don't know. I'd have to go look. If I get a book bub or something, that tips things. But I, it's very much been for me dependent on, like, it's great to have backlists and these books continue to sell. Maybe if I don't have any ads, they're still selling a couple hundred a month. Uh, I have a lot of books I was looking before the show. You know, I have a few things that are selling four digits a month, right? And then I have most of my stuff is maybe only a couple hundred or, you know, four or 500 a month. So it's not so much that I have any rock star books. Usually it's just cumulative once you have more titles out. And usually there's one series that's the newest one that's kind of a breadwinner uh, pulling in a lot. But uh, in my case now, the back, back stuff alone will put me over that mark. And this year, I think my pen name will also be over that mark, which makes me wonder about the author earnings thing. How many of those authors might be the same person? Because <laughs> that will be me this year if they happen to do another uh, update uh, this year. Um, so you might be able to make it with like not that many books, but to keep it going consistently year after year, that's what I've had to keep writing new series, keep releasing new series. Uh, if you write less quickly, but have a big backlist, you can do more advertising than I do. I, I do try to like get an ad for those book ones every now and then, you know, I'm like, oh, it's been a year since Balance on the Blade's Edge was on Free Book C, so let's go ahead and try to get an ad. And, and that will help keep moving people through the series. But I, I at any given time, I have a newer series that's counting for not a good chunk. You know, it's hard as the backlist grows. It's hard to, I'd have to like break it down. Maybe I'll do that this year in October. But um, usually there's one series current that's doing quite a bit of the heavy lifting. Uh, what isn't, advice isn't relevant. You know, we do this show every week. There's some new marketing tactic to try and the tactics change every year. The solid stuff does not, you know, write in a series, make sure your stuff's good enough to entertain people. I mean, we're not trying to necessarily be high literary stuff here, but you need to look at your sell through from book one to book two. If you don't have a lot of people going on to read the rest of your series, m you know, may maybe it's trying to try a new series. Uh, if you're not selling many of book one, take a look at that book. You know, the blurb never, that has to be good. That stuff never changes the cover. You know, it might change a little bit what's popular, but a good cover, uh, a good blurb, solid editing, at least clean, you know, stuff that never changes. The way you get people to buy book one and find book one, that's the stuff that may change in and out each year. So that you should keep listening to our podcast because uh, even if we're not that cutting edge, we try to get guests on who are, you know, debuted in the last couple of years and have proven that, yes, you can do it right now. All right. Hannah asks, from a new author perspective, is it worth putting in a lot of money up front or starting with the, just starting with the essentials of editing and cover design? And, and we kind of answered this. Uh, the 100K people weren't necessarily putting in tons of money into editing or cover art, so not necessary. I agree. Yep. All right. Dale says, I'm probably channeling Jeff, but <laughs> what's the single most effective thing you can do in to help become a six-figure author? Keep writing. <laughs> keep writing. Keep releasing books. Yeah, I think, I think uh, building up a large catalog is probably the single most effective thing you can do because even if you are hoping that you're going to get a lucky break, like the people who think you need a lucky break, every single one of those books you release is a lottery ticket that could get lucky. And, uh, you know, the more lottery tickets, the more chances to win. So Very ideally true. you'd be using all of the series tactics to, to increase your earnings and have just a bigger backlist and a longer long tail. But all of the things sort of require you to have a lot of books. And we won't say that having a lot of books automatically is going to make you a six-figure author. You know, if you haven't done like the the workshops or kind of the story craft stuff, it's, you know, it's worth continuing to educate yourself as an author. And I have to remind myself of that too. It's very easy for me to just go on autopilot and go, oh yeah, I like this. Let's just do this story and wing it, <laughs> you know, and, but I should, I'm bad about it. I should be going to more conferences and, and panels and watching videos on YouTube too, and trying to continue to make the stories better. 
Um, but yeah, if you have a good series, a couple of good series will get you there. Uh, one series might get you there briefly, you know, but almost everything has its day on Amazon and, and maybe you'll get another day when you get a book bub ad and on a box set and that really kicks things off. But for the most part, it's hard to keep the same series just selling as well year in and year out. Um, unless you're writing your Jim Butcher, right? And you just keep putting out new books and it's working. Uh, that's tough. That's something you'll have to decide individually if you can just keep putting books out in the same series and if you continue to get as many people in there or not. Uh, some, soft, some authors f find there's attrition after a while and uh, other authors just find that they need to be refreshed and you know start something new. That's kind of me. After about eight books, I'm like, uh, <laughs> I'm done with these characters. It's time to start something new. All right, Dale also asks, what's the least effective thing that will help you become a six-figure author? Hmm. Not writing. <laughs> yeah, not writing. <laughs> Listening to too many podcasts and <laughs> not writing uh, the next book. Uh, I would say trying to write your book there and you have too many distractions, like i.e. the internet. You know, stay the hell away from YouTube. You'll be fine. Yeah, I guess, you know, that's the corollary. If writing a lot of books is the best way to... to, to increase your chances at earnings than not writing a book. A lot of books isn't. However, I will say um, if you are pumping a ton of money into something for a long time and not seeing a long return, like if you're self-producing your own audio books and you've done four of them and spending $7,000 on each one and you haven't made back the money from the first one, basically uh, don't just keep throwing good money after bad uh, or, you know, you can, you can lose a lot of otherwise good earnings by failing to see the patterns of what helps and what doesn't. So stop and assess every now and then to make sure that you're still making the right decisions. Right, I remember someone early on when I got started had a 12 book series and he was really frustrated and nobody was basically buying book one because nobody was that interested in or maybe it wasn't that good. And he'd invested so much time in writing this huge series. And it, you know, if that's your passion, that's your dream, that's what you wanted to do forever, by all means write it. But if you really wanna make this a day job, you know, or get to six figures, you have to be kind of smart about your projects. Go ahead and try lots of things. Like Joe was saying, it's, you never know what's gonna, it's hard to predict what's gonna be good. The stuff I think is gonna be a winner is usually like, eh, did okay. And then randomly, you know, I'm like, I would never have guessed like my Dragon Blood series did really well. That just started as a one-off standalone uh, that I didn't intend to make into a series and ended up being a, a real earner for me. So watching and seeing what of your stuff is doing well and is worth investing more time in. Like, you know, Joe is doing more uh, Book of Deacon because that's been a, a good seller for him. Yep. All right, last question and we'll wrap it up. Of course, we went long as always. Um, and this isn't really related to six figures, but I thought I'd throw it in here anyway since Ryan was good enough to ask it. Is it worth trying a new pen name when switching from fantasy to space adventure when you currently have a small fan base? Uh, I haven't used any pen names, so I can't answer that one. I haven't uh, done a pen name either. I will say, it. My, well, I mean, obviously, the most useful answer will be the last one you're here. But uh, I, I will say that um, it might be useful if you feel as though there's not going to be a lot of over. That's to say, if you are certain that the readers of your fantasy are dedicated fantasy readers, or if your tone is going to be massively different. Like I've written a lot of sci-fi, a lot of fantasy, a lot of steampunk, but you can pretty much tell you're reading a Joe Lalo novel, no matter which one of those you're reading. If you are creating an extremely different voice or it, worse, if you are, are, are making a move over into something that might even like take you from YA to adult, then that sort of hard division, probably you would benefit from a, a pen name. Right. Just in general, I wouldn't do it for sci-fi and fantasy. They're pretty close, and I, I think you will get a lot of crossover. Uh, not necessarily everyone, but more so than hard-boiled mystery. Uh, sorry, Jeff. You're not hard-boiled. You're corgi mystery. And I, I actually think that you... Mystery is the name of it. Thank you that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that like, you're kind of like Joe, though, probably. It sounds like the style is the same, and people would probably enjoy both of them, maybe 
Yeah, it's, I, I mean, one thing I've noticed is, and I, and I actually considered it because I say I I was always writing third person omniscient, you know, with the, the epic fantasy, and I was like, I wanted something completely different, something just you know, I, I needed to, I needed it to change, so I went with first person narrative on this one, so it's a little bit different. I you know threw some more expletives in there, a little more violence, and I'm like, huh, I don't know if my fantasy lover's gonna like this after all. And I had a few reviews that said, ah, he didn't need all the swearing in there. I was like, well, you know what? There's no dragons here, so I I don't have to try and purposely keep this one clean i can do what i want with this one but oh well it are you saying the dragons don't approve of the swearing so <laughs> <laughs> you have dragons, dragons are not gonna you. allow curse words <laughs> no I, just, I i've had so many people tell me that the fan my fantasies are, are good for you know pretty much all ages even though i wasn't trying for that that i've actually now tried to keep them that way whereas these this mystery is like yeah it's a murder mystery with a lot of humor in it oddly enough <laughs> All right. Well, another two, if you wanted to try, like if your first books didn't sell that well and maybe the reviews aren't that great, that might be another reason you want to try to start fresh with a new name. It probably wouldn't matter anyway, but I've seen people do that. Sometimes they'll start a pen name to, as in a way to experiment. You know, like maybe I want to write Dragon Erotica today, but I don't want my regular readers to know about it. Or maybe just the debut stuff wasn't that well received and you're hoping for a fresh start under a new name. That's a possibility. But in general, it's twice the amount of work. So I would not do it unless, in my case, the adult books are much more <laughs> graphic. So I, that was specifically the reason why I made the choice, because some people complained when there was a sex scene in one of my books. Like, Jeff, I'm not, maybe not quite as YA okay, but in general, I didn't have a lot of that in my earlier books. So that was what, why I made the switch. But it, the only other perk is you, you can try to get a BookBub bu, book bub ad for both names at the same time. But in my case, Good Ruby point. never gets BookBub ads, so it didn't really matter. I think there was one time where she got one and I got one uh, the same month and I was like, ooh, this is cool. But it's pretty tough now to even get one. So, and, but yeah, you're just going to have to maintain two websites. Maybe if you want to do social media or answer email, Ruby gets email and I have to like, oh shoot, I got to remember to <laughs> answer that email. Uh, you all know how I am at email, but in general, you're making more work for yourself. So unless you have a really good reason, I would say just keep it all together. Sounds good. All right. Finishing up. Do you guys just want to say whatever you have out now, if you want Anybody go check out your new book? Oh, uh, well, my new fantasy is out. It's uh, my series number four. It's another L Lantari series set in the same world. Uh, may the May the Fang be with you. Pirates of Purrs, number one. Uh, doing pretty good. I've got a lot of good reviews on it so far, so I can't complain. Um, I've got Struck Tophus, the 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 now infamous book about of a dragon who is also a pizza oven. Uh, also, uh, the fourth God, book I in my that. <laughs> yeah, the fourth book in my steampunk series, uh, uh, the series of Free Wrench. The book is the Calderon Problem is on pre-order now. It will be coming out uh, on September fifth and September twentieth because it's got an early release on Apple. And those are my two things I'm pushing. All right, cool. Well, I haven't had a new release for myself for a while, but I am putting my Fallen Empire books out everywhere now, and Star Nomad is free for the summer. So if you haven't tried them and want to give it a try, go look it up, Star Nomad. Lots of Firefly kind of stuff, fun fun sci-fi. <laughs> We're so good at plugging our stuff, guys. Here, an hour and a half in, maybe we should mention our books. All right, <laughs> but uh, we really appreciate you guys listening, and thank you to those who came and watched on YouTube we're almost always on on Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. If you want to stop by YouTube, our channel is Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast. Imagine that. Uh, or just, you know, subscribe, listen whenever you want. We appreciate it. If you get a chance on iTunes and could leave a review, we would appreciate that. I, I never remember to ask for this stuff, so we have, like, five reviews. <laughs> but uh, we appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening, everyone, and have a good week. All right, you guys, take it easy. So long, everybody. <laughs>